Hello friends! Welcome to another episode of Lessons with Laura. I am Laura Ingalls Gunn. Today we are going to be talking about sunbonnets. The sunbonnet is probably the article of clothing most closely associated with Laura Ingalls Wilder and pioneering women. Scholars have devoted years of research just on the sunbonnet, writing amazing thesis papers, and their research is absolutely valid because the lowly sunbonnet is pretty amazing. It comes in a wide variety of styles and has various details that no two are alike if you're looking at extant antique sunbonnets. And so I just thought today I would share with you some of the sunbonnets that I have made and some of the sunbonnets that I have collected. Now, a few years ago when I first started doing historic costuming, I wanted to recreate the iconic costume that was worn by Carolyn Ingalls in the television show Little House on the Prairie. So I created a rolled collar blouse and this sunbonnet, which has a ruffle along its brim and then a short curtain. Now this curtain piece was also known as a bavolet. That is a French term that means flap. And some individuals refer to it as a bavolette. That's okay too, tomato, tomato, uh, whichever you prefer. And this was done from the McCall's pattern that I talked about in last week's video when we looked at a pioneering dress. And for this one, I wanted to try adding a little bit of lace to the brim. And certainly, you would have seen lace on some sunbonnets because for many women, um, they had their Sunday best sunbonnet as well as their work sunbonnet. And how uh, their Sunday best was often differentiated is for children, it could be made out of a fine white batiste fabric, just like this one. Uh, certainly, this is probably for a very small child, around four or five years of age. And in thinking about, did I want to put my kids in white uh, when they were four and five years old? Absolutely not. I can think of the chocolate hands uh, as we're, we're speaking. Um, so this is probably why this sunbonnet is still in existence because it just probably was only worn um, to very special outings or Sunday services. And it features fairly uh, mid-length straps. The brim has been stitched um, over and over and, and that helps to keep the brim in shape. And the element that I love about this sunbonnet is that if you undo these buttons, then the sunbonnet can be laid flat on your ironing board for ease in ironing. And you know, you're probably thinking, really? they ironed their sunbonnets? Absolutely. So there you can see how the shape was created. You have your buttons on one side and your buttonholes on the other. So even for scrubbing purposes, you know, you think about the washboard, that that would have been easier to scrub to get clean. And then storage, that it could be stored flat. So this is a rather ingenious um, design for this bonnet. And, you know, so for a child to be wearing this, um, what is the purpose of a sunbonnet? Well, 
they did not have sunscreen like we did today. And keeping one's complexion nice was important, just like it, our anti-wrinkle creams that we have today. That was the way of their uh, eliminating the chance for sunburn as well as preserving their complexion. And so, you know, this particular sunbonnet um, has the rounded edges which would allow a little bit more of a view when worn. Um, Laura famously talked about in the Little House books, she really didn't like her sunbonnets uh, because she couldn't see. And if you've ever worn a sunbonnet, I absolutely understand why she didn't like it. And now, you know, the other thing to talk about the, des the design in the ironing of their sunbonnets in the book Little House on the Prairie, you know, they're in the absolute middle of nowhere. They probably haven't passed by another wagon of people in days. But there is Ma in the back of the wagon, and she has set up a makeshift ironing board, if you will, and I'm sure Pa had built a fire um, to place her various irons, and she's in the back of the wagon ironing the clothes and the sunbonnets. And I, I'm just thinking, Caroline, really? Why are you doing this to yourself? What eliminate that chore? But you know, it was a very different time back then, and people very much took pride in their appearance. And even though the Ingalls were a family of very limited financial means, it was very important um, to Ma that her girls and her husband were presented at the best that they could do. And so she was going to make sure that they had somewhat clean clothes and they were going to be freshly ironed because it, it was definite, uh, you know, a sign that you, you had some education, that you were cultured, that you cared about your appearance. So I, I just love that design um, and that sweet little sunbonnet. Now, this sunbonnet is a very similar design in that it can be removed um, and it actually has really short straps. So when it's tied on, um, you know, you can't even really tie it in a bow. It's, it's just a basic knot. And that makes an awful lot of sense because if you are working out in the fields, you're bending over, um, perhaps planting seeds, or you're even working with machinery, you do not want long straps to get caught in whatever chore you are doing. You want them out of the way. And this was absolutely a work sunbonnet. Um, this fabric was uh, is an indicator that this is definitely made after the turn of the century. Um, another clue that I have is that it has some very well rusted metal snap fasteners. And I, I probably could uh, t tighten them down a little bit better with some needle and thread, but I kind of like to, to leave it like I found it. Um, but going back to the snap fasteners, the patent for metal snap fasteners was made in 1885. So you would not have seen metal snap fasteners on any type of garment prior to that. And, and even then, uh, when it was first patented, it was primarily put forth as a fastener for men's trousers. So that's, that's a very good clue that this particular sunbonnet, uh, based on the fabric, the snap fasteners, you know, it, it was definitely made in the, um, turn of the century, 20th century. 
Uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of some of the modern patterns, and I mentioned this in last week's episode, they have you use um, the traditional elastic that we're all well familiar with um, at the back of the bonnets to create the, the gathered um, curtain ruffle. And that assists you with getting it over if you have you know, your buns. I'm not gonna put the hat on because then when I remove it, um, my hair will be all askew. But that just assists you with getting it over your hair and into position. Well, elastic, a type of elastic, that's a better term, was first patented in 1820, and it was kind of elastic threads. And you see it mainly uh, used in gloves and shoes. It's not used in clothing. And elastic as we know it today, um, really did not start to be in use until the 1900s and most often it was seen in undergarments, not too much in clothing. So that's another way that you can indicate um, what era was this garment made. And so in terms of historical accuracy, you're thinking, okay, well, then how did they tighten their sunbonnets? Well, what they would have done is they created a channel of fabric and inside would have been a tie. And if you would, I have to be very careful when I'm doing this, but as you pulled the tie, that would then gather your fabric and then you would just tie it in a knot or a bow to hold it in position. So that's that's a good indicator because elastic was just basically non-existent, not used during the time of Laura's childhood. So if you are uh, attempting to make a historically accurate sunbonnet, that definitely is a feature that you will want to include. You will not want to use elastic. And as you can see, I have made both types of sunbonnets, um, those that are historically accurate and those that have the ease of, of elastic. Uh, the costuming community is wide and wonderful and every everyone is welcome uh, whatever their preference in costuming um have fun have fun with it and i have to say that i love this sunbonnet so much now again um, in dating this this has the bright colors I'm gonna say it's probably 1930s, um, and it also has the snap fasteners, but uh, I'll, I'll snap it together as as we're talking so you can see the sunbonnet. But, you know, this was such a well-loved bonnet because you look at the exterior versus the interior brim. I mean, this sunbonnet was just worn, literally almost worn to death. I mean, I don't think those ties could get any more tattered. And it also features, um, you know, the tie closure in, in the channel. And the bavelet is a lot longer. So this was definitely a, a work bonnet. Um, you know, the curtain, if you wanted to protect the back of your neck and shoulders, you would create an extra long curtain. So this is a sun bonnet that I made um, earlier in the fall of last year. And it has, 
you know, numerous stitching to keep the uh, brim in a shape that is fairly firm. Uh, another type of sunbonnet was the corded sunbonnet, and they would actually sew channels and slide cording through it, and that also helped to keep its shape. And you know, this just has a really long curtain, and it is of the design that if you take off, and I think uh, there were 20 buttons total. I mean, that was a really good time making all of those buttonholes and sewing on all of these buttons. And again, just to kind of show you the interior, I made it in the traditional manner that it is gathered with a fabric tie. And um, it, even though this probably would have been a work bonnet, this design, I still wanted to make it a little bit pretty, so it does feature uh, a ruffled edge. And um, I have to say though, when I have this on, I cannot see anything but what is right in front of me. And you know, so that, that leads us to a good point. Women are wearing these sunbonnets, and of course, I imagine if if men that was all there was around, they probably would have protected themselves with a bonnet too. You know, it is most closely associated with women, but uh, I, I'm sure there were uh, some men that perhaps wore them. And you think about everything that they're doing in their day, and you have dim a diminished visual ability. And I just think about, well, that's an accident waiting to happen. And no doubt it, it probably uh, caused an accident or two or 2,000 or, you know, and, and I, I just so admire the perseverance of the pioneers and you know for many of the women um, they were not able to afford a fancy bonnet you know that would have been made out of straw that you would have purchased from a store their their only type of head covering would have been a sun bonnet and often not as a dress um, had perhaps stains or was starting to wear in some areas, they would have taken the fabric from the skirt of the dress and cut it down into articles of clothing for their children or even a sunbonnet. So it wasn't unusual that the repurposed fabric from a, a lady's dress would have been then used to create their sunbonnet. Another type of bonnet that I have made is called a slat bonnet. And it has a shorter curtain in the back and um, still traditionally I did make it, you know, with the channel and the tie. And why it is called a slat bonnet is because you have these channels that have been sewn into the brim. And to keep them upright, ladies would insert thin pieces of wood, cardboard, or pasteboard, and they just slide into the channels. Now, you may think, okay, why are you still able to pull those out? Well, of course, um, you know, you're wearing this out in the field, you're sweating. So this is an article of clothing that is going to be washed over and over. And if you've ever studied the methods of washing at that time, it was very hard on your clothing. 
And so the cardboard or the pasteboard needed to be removed because it would not have survived even a single washing process. Um, you're dealing with incredibly hot boiling water, lye soap, vigorous scrubbing, and then the line drying um, often in the bright hot sun. So that was why the slats were removed. This is actually one of my favorite um, sunbonnets to wear because the slats do create more of an open brim and so I have a wider range of vision which is definitely a plus and you know I, I have to say too sunbonnets have fallen out of fashion very much so um, but for me personally uh, in the early spring and definitely in the summer when I am doing my spring and summer gardening, I actually like to wear a sunbonnet. Um, I live in Texas. It gets really warm. And, you know, those little rivers of perspiration that start to come down, the sunbonnet catches all of that. So you don't have the sweat running into your eyes, you know, giving that horrible stinging sensation you're fully covered. Um, I do not tan. I, oh, I go from this to sunburn in about 10 minutes. So having that protection I love as opposed to a straw hat and you know having the ties underneath my chin uh, is also a plus because we, we can get quite a bit of wind here in Texas and so straw hats just kind of fall off of me really easy. So, you know, if, uh, if you want to give your hand at maybe sewing your own sun bonnet, um, there are many, many patterns available and you'll quickly see that, that they come in a wide variety of styles and just even selecting uh, various fabrics, adding ruffles, Adding lace can really change um, the look of each of your sunbonnets. Now, next week, we're going to be shifting to the Regency era. And of course, that is very much a time period before Laura, even before her mother. It would have been uh, more the time period of Laura Colby Ingalls, Laura's paternal grandmother, who was born in 1810, which was, of course, the height of uh, the Regency era. And I have decided to make a Regency ensemble that is close to historically accurate as I can get it. So I've been working on my under things and I will share those with you next week. If you have enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It's in the lower corner there, and that will allow you to be notified of when a new video is up. And a thumbs up is also appreciated. Details on the sun bonnets, uh, I will write an accompanying post on my website and link to that post so you can get more of the history as well as the documentation that I used. Just use, click on the words, click more, and the link will be below that. I hope you have a wonderful day.